check, check, check. Check, check. Good morning. Good, 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 good. Is the speech muted? Check, check, check. There I am. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's Baptism Sunday. We're going to celebrate people choosing Jesus today. I'm glad it was Baptism Sunday because I spilled somebody's coffee this morning all over my pants. And so I, I got changed for baptisms a little early here. Um, but it's, it, it was my fault. It's a, it's a good day. Let me read this out of John chapter 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. The Word was with God in the beginning, and all things were created by Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines on in the darkness, but the darkness has not mastered it. A man came, sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that everyone might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created by him, but the world did not recognize him. He came to what was his own, but his own people did not receive him. But to all who have rejected him, those who believe in his name, he has given the right to become God's children, children not born by human parents or by human desire or a husband's decision, but by God. Now the word became flesh and took up its residence among us. We saw his glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth who came from the Father. John testified about him and shouted, This one was the one about whom I said, He who comes after me is greater than I, because he existed before me. For we have all received from his fullness one gracious gift after another. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came about through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only one, himself God, who is in closest fellowship with the Father, has made God known. Amen? Amen. We are here because of what Jesus did on the cross. That we can know the creator of the universe. We can know God through the Holy Spirit inside of us. We can experience the love of God here this morning. Lord, we come to declare your worthiness. Thank you that you have showered upon us your grace and mercy. And so, Lord, today as we gather to worship you, we respond to the work that you did on the cross. We recognize you, Jesus. And we exalt you. We lift you on high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the King of Kings here this morning. When you move, you make my heart pound. 
the gates let heaven on in come rest on us come rest on us fire and wind come and do it again open up the gates let heaven on in come rest on us come rest on us come down the spirit when you move moving make my heart pound when you fill the room
its center. Jesus, it's always been you at the center of all. We declare it, Lord. You're the center of all. No other agenda, Lord. You are the center that matter.
righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest way, but only lean on Jesus' name. Let's sing that again. Let's make that our prayer this morning. Our hope is truly built on nothing less than Jesus and Jesus alone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ray, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the Son. time of communion and I you know often when we invite you to get the elements we say you know say hi to somebody um, that's a hundred percent right to do but today I, I want to ask you not to do that I want to stay in this moment um, I don't know how many of you are aware there's something coming up Tuesday um, and you know this election one thing I'm pretty confident it's gonna be a mess and the world is gonna watch it and you and I have an amazing opportunity here to declare who we really are. And if you're here as a follower of Christ, you are not first a Democrat, you're not first a Republican. As offensive as it may be to some, you're not first an American. You're first a follower of Christ. And nine times out of 10, when I lead communion, I'm gonna talk about remembering but there's another thing that happens when we take communion, it's a declaration. And one of the things that we declare is, I stand Jesus on you. And so when, when people come up later and get baptized, you know, part of it is coming up and doing it. I think part of communion for us is going and getting it. So will you keep this a little solemn? I know some of you can't help but say hi to somebody, Gary, but, um, <laughs> Will you keep it just a little solemn? 
and make getting the elements part of your declaration that above and beyond all of it, Jesus, I am yours. So go ahead and get the elements. Will you pray with me to start this? Jesus, so often um, when we come to your table, we remember you as we are supposed to. We remember your body broken. We remember your blood shed. But Lord, I think we need something just a little different today. And I think through eating this and drinking this, we need to reaffirm for ourselves, for the person sitting next to us, for a world that is in trouble, that we are yours. First and foremost, we are yours. We are your people. We are your bride. We are your followers. We are your body. And so, Lord, as we go into a week that's likely to be a mess and maybe scary and overwhelming and frustrating, we declare again today that our hope is you and our hope is built on nothing less than you. And I know, Lord, that we have different prayers here today. We're, I suspect, praying for different outcomes in this election. And Lord, our hope is not the outcome of this election. Our hope is you, you alone, and nothing less. And so as we eat this and drink this, Lord, give us strength to make that our declaration before each other and before you. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, he broke it, and he gave thanks. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Let's eat together. And then in the same way, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to them. And he said, drink of this. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you. Let's drink together. Jesus, I am deeply grateful for this time of worship, and I am deeply grateful for this moment when we can do something physical, going up and getting the elements, eating and drinking, to say that we are yours. We are yours, and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Since I'm on staff, not on staff, they don't really tell me what's coming next, so I kind of just make it up. 
Um, but I know that I think Abby has a video, an announcement video. So we're going to go right to that. Logan, if that's not what we're supposed to do, too bad. <laughs> hey, G, what you doing? Oh, hey, not much. Just kind of getting the baptismal all set for the baptisms this Sunday at the end of the service. What are you doing? Well, I was just thinking about our worship night that was happening on Wednesday at 6.30. Are you going to be there? I sure am. <laughs> Me and a whole team. And you should come too. And speaking of music, we are going to be starting a Christmas choir. Rehearsals are going to start in November and it's open to anybody. Anybody at all. Anybody? Even me? Well, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yes, anybody at all. There's no experience necessary. Just come see me. I'll give you all the details that you need to know. But before we get to Christmas, we have to think about Thanksgiving. For Thanksgiving, our youth group is doing something super special. They are gathering a lot of Thanksgiving dinner items to put together boxes for families who might need a Thanksgiving meal. So if you are a family or if you know of a family who needs a Thanksgiving meal, you can sign up on our sign up sheets that are located by our giving table. And everybody, don't forget, we are going to have lunch right after service. And then after we fill our bellies with all the yummy food, we are also going to stay to do a church cleanup around the building. And now just before we wrap up this whole announcement time, there's a special thing that we really do want to do right now. We've put together a, a video that will show our thanks and our appreciation to our two amazing pastors. Sit back and enjoy. You can begin whenever you'd like. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Say whatever you want. Go ahead and start. Hey, y'all. No. Uh, okay. um, so it's just like how they have impacted your life as a pastor oh, or a friend. So much. Why I appreciate you or something like that where you look in the camera. Okay. Happy Pastor Appreciation Month, Week, whatever it may be. Um, I appreciate our pastors uh, every day. Um, every day, every year, every month, but particularly Pastor Logan has meant a lot to us as a couple, mm -hmm. a family, and for me personally. Logan has transformed my relationship with Jesus. Um, I have wanted to know him more. I have learned so much. Um, he's inspired me to dive deeper into the Bible, into the Word. There are no words to really be able to say thank you um, or we appreciate you because we love you and you are a gift. A gift to this church, a gift to all the families, a gift to all the people, um, young and old. Um, he's a go-getter. He doesn't ever want to give up and uh, the drive to get something done is kind of like nothing I've ever seen before. Just go, go, go. We love you. We appreciate you. Thanks for teaching us many things. I want to just say thank you to both of you for being just absolutely welcoming, loving, and supportive, welcoming me onto this team. I'm just so thankful that God has provided me with two outstanding leaders who are humble, who love Jesus, love people. Amy, I love to see your smile. Your smile always makes my day better. I thank you for your openness, your giggles, and just always having an open door policy. I really appreciate that. Thank you for showing me what level of enthusiasm and just love for children that the bar is set at. It's amazing to see. It's amazing to see you with the kids and it has made a real impact in my life. And as I step forward in my journey into youth ministry, it's getting to see what it looks like to be done well. I just thank all of your wisdom. Uh, Logan, it's, it's hard to even know where to start. Your hard work and long hours and dedication, especially behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know about, does not go unnoticed. Your work ethic and passion set you apart. I also love the friendship we have developed through these projects and beyond these walls. For me personally, my walk with Jesus has changed over the past year as I listen and learn from your teachings and discover 
new ways to apply them to my life. I have a better understanding of God's word as you explain sometimes hard to understand situations. As I've gotten out of my comfort zone, I can now embrace change as well. Thank you so much for everything. And I know God has great plans for this church and great things for you and your family in the future. I actually never envisioned myself having a pastor as a friend. My kids and I have a landing place when we have questions. And sometimes it just helps to have somebody to talk to in general. So we've seen so much hospitality and so much love and so much care. And so we're really, really glad to be a part of this and to know both of them as friends and they've become just wonderful parts of our family. This is Pastor Dean Wheeler. I'm glad to hear that the Lakes Church is celebrating its pastors, Pastor Logan and Pastor Amy. I want to speak to you about Pastor Amy and her commitment to King Jesus and his church. Over the years of service together, the phrase that encapsulates for me, Pastor Amy, would be whatever it takes. Pastor Amy was willing to do whatever it takes for Jesus and the well-being of his church. From her commitment to the study of Orthodox biblical theology, to her and William's willingness to open their homes and their hearts to people, her taking the bull by the horns when I announced that I was planning on retiring and guiding both the transition team and the search team for a new senior pastor. Well done, Pastor Amy. But for me, the most memorable time was at the outset of the pandemic and her willingness to do whatever it takes to communicate to kids and families by stepping way out of her comfort zone and doing a crazy crash dive into video puppet ministries for those families stuck at their homes. You are brilliant. I love you, Pastor Amy. Um, I have something to tell you. I love you, Pastor Logan and Amy. It's not done. But Amy, if you could come up here too. All right. So I know you hate this. Both of you hate this. I think we'll just have you stand. Come on over here. Come on over here. I'm going to have Philip come up too. So, you know, as a church, we don't always, I know we all try to, right? We all try to express how much we appreciate all of the work that these two do. And I know that some of us know how much there is that goes on behind the scenes. But I think it's been a little bit since we've done this together as a congregation. And so I think it's important that we take the time to pray over them. And, um, you know, we would have had you all come up here, but that's a little bit a lot. <laughs> and so what we want to do as your representatives, Philip and I are going to pray over Logan and Amy. Okay? But we are just your representatives. And so what I want you to do is be holding your hands out like this. All right? Even if you're not comfortable with it, nope, everybody's doing it, okay? <laughs> now, imagine that you're touching their shoulders. And let my words be your words. So, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for the ministry of Pastor Amy. Lord, only you know all of the struggles that she has come through, all of the roads that she has walked Lord, when I think of her, I think of that definition of faithfulness as being a long obedience in the same direction. And Lord, you have given her that. You have given her perseverance. You have given her steadfastness. You have given her this unflinching devotion to you and to advancing your kingdom, no matter what it looks like, as Pastor Dean said, no matter what it takes. Lord, we are so grateful that we have Pastor Amy to lead us and to guide us, to be the glue that holds this place together. And we pray that you would continue to lead her, Lord. Lead her beside still waters. Guide her in your name's sake, Lord, in right paths of righteousness. Continue to set a table before her in the presence even of enemies sometimes. 
And Lord, may your goodness and your mercy and your kindness follow her all the days of her life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Father, I I, uh, remember so clearly sitting in the office back in South Beloit when Logan and Haley told us they were coming here. Um, I remember the heartbreak of that, and, and I remember the fear that I had that, Lord, as, as broken as they were and as tired as they were, uh, we were leaning on them entirely. And my first honest thought was, what about me, though? Um, and now here I am, uh, deeply grateful, Father, to have Logan as my pastor he is a challenge to me. He is a amazing young man with an incredible set of talent and an amazing passion. And Father, it's been such a joy for me to sit back and listen to what other people say about him and about his life and about his ministry. And I know that there are a hundred prayers in this room right now that are better than mine a hundred thank yous that are better than mine. And Lord, I, I, I just will rarely say this because I rarely get it. But God, I just have this image of you spreading your wings over Amy and Logan and their families and sheltering them. They give a lot This demands a lot. There's a lot expected of them. But ultimately, God, what they need and what we need is you. Hide them in the shelter of your wings. Protect them. Strengthen them. Encourage them. Give them wisdom, perseverance, and patience. Hold them up when they're weak. Guide them to rest when they need it. Help them to be willing to take a seat by those still waters sometimes and build this body into whatever you want it to be with them as your under-shepherds. In Jesus' name, amen. Not for long. Oh. Well, I gave Haley one rule. I said, don't make it a part of service. <laughs> well, thank you, guys. I, um, you know, there, it's, it's a unique job. You feel, at times, you can feel a lot of rejection as a pastor um, because People will leave the church and be like, we're leaving for this reason, and they don't think, but you, you know, many times you can, you, you, you take that, you know, um, you take that as a friend saying, I don't want to be friends with you anymore. Um, and to be honest, like, this week was hard for me. I was, I was discouraged, and so thank you very much for, for the encouragement and the love. Um, It is a joy and an honor to to, to be here and to pastor here. So thank you. Um, I I got to transition into this now. Um, I wanted to share a a little testimony for me personally, you know, in building off of of what, um, we're going to call him Uncle Phil now. That's his new nickname. (laughs) What what Uncle Phil said, he doesn't want Pastor Phil, so he's Uncle Phil. Um, about uh, on communion, like we're going to build, like we want to build our lives on Jesus and stand on the ground of Jesus. And, and I've been thinking of, of a testimony in my life that has transformed mine and Haley's relationship and our marriage and how we live our lives. So it was, it was probably like seven years ago now. Um, it was when I got my, my first paid um, position, or I don't know, maybe eight years ago, something like seven, eight years ago, first paid position in a church, I was, um, I think I was paid $10,000 a year, and Haley was a second year teacher, so we were, we were raking in the dough, if you, 
Um, and we lived in Austin, Texas, or just outside Austin, Texas. And uh, there, was, there was a moment where now that, you know, like we were establishing our lives, and, and it was like the Lord put it on our hearts. Am I going to be first in your life? And we wanted to say yes to that answer. And we had no money at the time, and so money was the number one thing that was like, like, how are we going to pay our bills? How are we going to, you know, do this? And, um, and, and so we felt convicted by the Lord to say yes to the, to the Lord first and foremost in our money. And I'll say this, from that, from that moment forward, there, there has, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a month that has gone on that Haley and I have not tithed. And, it, and it's not that it, it's a tithe because, like, we feel compelled or because we feel like we're supposed to. It, it, is a, it is an act of worship in our hearts to put Jesus first. And over the years, what we've seen is the Lord provide time and time. I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying it was like a process. You know what? We still don't have money. <laughs> you know, it's still really tight. It's not like we get checks in the mail every week with, you know, $10,000 because we gave whatever, but, but it has anchored our lives around Jesus. It has anchored, and, and it's, it's gone so much, it's, it's a conviction inside of us where like, you know, this past year we looked at all of our bills and we saw what we're, you know, we saw what we're spending on our mortgage, we saw this, and, and we, like if we want God to be number one, then, then God has to be number one. And so our tithe is the first thing that comes out in the month it, it, it's more important to us than our mortgage. And so if something's more important to you than your mortgage, like we, had, we made that decision, like it's more important, so it needs to be more than our mortgage. If we can't afford our tithe because of our mortgage, then our mortgage is too big. Our worldly investment is too big. And, and I just, I want to share this from the point of, like, I, I know that there are many people here who maybe tithing is a foreign thing or, or giving to the Lord is a foreign thing or whatever, and I, I'm not, you, you're never supposed to give out of, out of compulsion or anything like that, but what I want to encourage you with is tithing or giving to the Lord is an act of worship, and when you build your life around all of your resources going to the Lord first, the organization and the structure of your life will change, and you'll also see the Lord as a provider in the way that you've never seen him before. He will teach you things about your money that you've never known. He will teach you things about your life that you've never seen. And, and so I want to just give an encouragement to you. This is my testimony and how it's changed, Haley and I, that the Lord is the first thing in our lives. And one of the reasons we're here today, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons that we're here today is because, because trust me, there have been moments in the last seven, eight years of our marriage where, where you know, maybe we've wanted to walk away, but we continued to put God first. And so one of the reasons that we're here is because we made that decision a long time ago. Um, and the Lord has been faithful. In our fear, he's been faithful. And so that comes above all. And so I want to invite you, if, if you haven't made that decision, I want to invite you into it. And, as, and if you have made that decision, I want to encourage you in it, that the Lord is going to continue to meet you where you are steadfast and where you are faithful. He will meet you there. And it's not meaningless. It is an act of worship. It is a spiritual discipline. Um, and, and the Lord values it and he watches it. Amen. So I want to just I want to just pray over this, um, and then I'm gonna hand hand it off to Uncle Phil to to preach the word today. So Lord, Lord, I just pray for each one of us here in this room. Lord, you have given resources of some kind to each person in this room, and Lord, I pray that you challenge them right now through the Holy Spirit. Am I giving back to the Lord? Are we worshiping the Lord with our time, with our gifts, with our finances, with our resources, with our compassion, 
with our love? Are we giving back to the Lord? And Jesus, if you are number one in our lives, Lord, I pray that you will align our lives so that we can give back to you. Lord, so that we can be obedient to you. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll convict us in our hearts, that our hearts will decide what we are to do. If we are to spend more of our time serving, Lord, I pray that you will lead us to serve and that we'll take that step. If we're supposed to give, Lord, I pray that we'll give financially with our resources, whatever it is. Lord, if we're supposed to love somebody more, I pray that we'll love. Convict us, Lord, in our hearts of where you are leading us. Lord, allow our lives to be a better act of worship and surrender to you. Help us steward what you have given us. Because in the end, every good thing has come from you, Jesus. And so we want to give back. We want to respond in worship to you and declare that you are the Lord of our lives. You are our solid rock. You are the most important things in our life. And so, Lord, let nothing, let nothing say otherwise. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you want to make that decision to financially support and to give unto the Lord here at the Lakes, there's a couple different ways you can do it online as well as there's an offering basket in the back of the room. Um, and, and that is an important act of worship. And so with that said, you ready, Uncle Phil? I guess. All right. Here's Philip Allen to teach about David and Goliath. <laughs> Why don't you take a second and now you can say hi to everybody while I get to it. Yeah. There is a story behind the Uncle Phil thing. Um, you are, are welcome to call me that. Uh, you are not welcome to call me Pastor Phil, no matter what happens. Um, I was yesterday morning sitting on the couch. I, I had the message done, um, but I like to go over it Saturday and just kind of fix it and, and get it in my head. And I was sitting on the couch, and I had my face in my hands, and I do that sometimes. And so, like, if you're talking to me and I do that, that means I can't believe what you just said. Um, but there are times I'm introverted, and, and there are times where I kind of sit and do that just because I need some me time. And so I was sitting on the couch and doing that, and Jean came out, and she said, what are you doing? Is everything okay? And I said, yeah, I'm just getting ready for this message, and... and um, I wanted to just take a little time and pray about it. So I got my thing out and I, I started working on it. And she stood there looking at me. And then she said, I don't think you prayed enough. <laughs> and I, she's probably right. You know, so, so when this message falls flat, it's Jean's fault <laughs> because she interrupted my prayer. I just could not get back in the stream of it then. So... Um, it's, I, I love you, but I got to be honest. You know. um, we're, I, I want to keep this really focused today. Um, we're actually, I think, probably going to spend at least a couple weeks on David and Goliath, maybe. So I don't know, Logan never has it set till later, but um, I don't know. And so we're not covering like the whole David and Goliath thing. There's just kind of a main idea that I want to pick out um, and I want to give you a, a statement first that, that might be kind of controversial. Um, you can disagree with it, and that's fine. Um, all I ask is, is just that you think about it. And the statement is this. God is both completely trustworthy. He is absolutely trustworthy. And he is profoundly trustworthy unpredictable, that he's completely trustworthy and he's profoundly unpredictable. That's kind of hard for us 
Because for the most part, if you trust someone, part of the reason you trust them is because they're predictable. Part of the reason you trust them is because you think you know what they're going to do, and that's why you trust them. The problem is, that is not why we trust God. We don't trust God because he is predictable. We don't trust him because he's going to do what we think he's going to do. In fact, he says very clearly, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Which means that me, in my finite life, in my finite mind, am probably not going to be able to successfully predict what an omnipotent, omniscient creator who transcends time is going to do. And so I want you to think about this idea of trusting God. We say to people, well, trust God. If you're like me, and I'm in the midst of a real struggle, and someone comes up, and they give me two words, and the two words are trust God, my temptation is to say, shut up. That doesn't help me. Because in, in my mind, and it's a very fallen mind, but in my mind, I need more than that. Because I'm kind of analytical, and I'm kind of skeptical. And, and, and I look at it, and I think, okay, great. I'm in this situation, and I trust God what? Or I trust God to what? And, and, and I'll tell you this, just from the experience of ministry, in 30 years of ministry, more than that of my own walk with God, I have both had and seen instances where someone trusts God to do something, and they'll even be really upfront with it. They'll say, well, I am trusting God for X. And then X doesn't happen. And then what happens? And I've seen a lot of people get to the point of starting, because of that, to doubt the goodness of God, to doubt the power of God, to doubt that God's there, that he's involved, that he cares. I have seen people begin to think that it's their own fault. I know of a, of a pastor who tells the story about they had a, a child who was intensely sick and died. And he went and talked to his pastor. And his pastor said, who sinned? You or your wife? Because there's something to blame. God did that, and there's got to be a reason he did it, and you must be the reason. Because if you had faith, if you had trust, if you just believed, if you just proclaimed, if you just stood the right way, then God would have done what you think he should have done. And see, the problem is, that's really not what God is like. It's really not what we can trust because our vision is too small. Our understanding is too limited. Simply put, and we don't always like to hear this, simply put, he's just too different from me. I hope in some small, really minor ways, maybe, I hope I'm like God a little. He is not remotely like me. And so it's important to come to terms with that. And I want to talk a little bit about the inner working of faith as David faces Goliath. What happened? within David, because we get pictures of it in this story. And I have heard and I've given sermons that have said, God's a God who defeats giants. What a great thing. And it's true. 
to a certain point. And there are also giants he doesn't defeat in this life, in the way we think he should, in the way we want him to. And so what happens in David? And I want to make two stops today. And again, I know that I'm, I know I'm treading on thin ice here. I know this is not really like the, the totally kind of just rah-rah message we, we want to hear. I know that, that some of this may feel a little bit controversial, but I want to make two stops today. And the two stops I want to make is that, first of all, there is a deep confidence that God can. There's a deep confidence that God can. No matter what you face, we should always have a deep confidence that God can. And if we're entirely honest, maybe a question of whether he will. A deep faith that he can and an honest question of whether he will. So first stop is can God do this? And you all know this story, right? The Israelites are on one side of a valley. The Philistines are on the other side of the valley. And the Philistines have this literally kind of supernaturally, preternaturally large, strong warrior who just is huge. And I don't want to go into huge, but like, like, like he would make Shaq look small, huge. He's just enormous, and he's strong, and he's mean, and he has armor, and he's got this huge spear, and he's just a guy that you don't want to even know, much less fight. He's the kind of person that you look at, and you go, I don't want to know that exists. I just don't want to know that's there. And so he comes out and he proposes, he says, guys, let's do this just one-on-one. You send a warrior down, we'll have it out. We win, you become our slaves. You win, we become your slaves. Over and over again that happens. None of the Israelite soldiers, and this is the thing I want you to see right here, None of the Israelite soldiers ever get to the question of, can God do this? The Israelite soldiers don't even ask that. Their question is, can I do this? And the answer to that is clearly no. It'd be similar to like LeBron James coming and saying, Phil, let's go one-on-one in basketball. Like, okay, you win. It's whatever we're playing to to zero. That's the score. We both know it's going to be the score. It's going to be ugly. I'm going to get hurt. You're going to win. Because I'm at a point in life where I get hurt sneezing. And so if I pray LeBron James, if I play LeBron James, that's just going to be ugly. And that's exactly what they're looking at. The Israelite soldiers look at it and they say, There is no hope of this. None. There's no way I can win this. And they never get to the question of can God handle this? They never even ask. It never occurs to them. And I'd like to suggest to you that often we are in that same boat. That we look at something and we think, I can't do it. I can't handle it. I can't budget it. I can't pay for it. I can't control it. I can't take it, whatever. And whatever the giant is, we compare it to ourselves instead of comparing the giant to God and saying, in effect, okay, well, I can't handle this, but God can. And so David comes along And he has a deep confidence that God can handle this. Now, why does he have that confidence? Well, let's look at at 1 Samuel 17. We're going to jump around a whole bunch. Well, not a whole bunch, because we're only going to look at about three or four places. But 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 33, is David talking. 
And so first Saul says to David, you're not able to do this. This is crazy. You're just a boy. He's been a warrior from his youth. It is nuts, David, that you think you can do this. And so David says, David replied to Saul, your servant has been a shepherd for his father's flock. Whenever a lion or bear would come and carry off a sheep from the flock, now put yourself right there. You're a shepherd. A lion or a bear takes a sheep. What are you going to do? I'm going home. <laughs> That's the end of the day right there. Sorry, Dad. There's a bear out there. Maybe we should raise corn. <laughs> so David, I would just picture this. I would go out after it, strike it down, and rescue the sheep from its mouth. Who is that? If it rose up against me, I would grab it by the jaw. Have you seen a bear? <laughs> hey, just go to the zoo. Go to the zoo sometime. Take 1 Samuel along and think, that lion, that bear, I'm going to grab it by the jaw. No, I'm not going to do that. That's crazy. I'd grab it by the jaw. I'd flip it around. I'd grab it by the jaw, strike it, and kill it. Verse 36. Your servant has struck down both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. I want you to notice that phrase. We're going to come back to that. And verse 37, David went on to say, The Lord who delivered me from the lion and the bear will also deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, <laughs> go. I, I got nothing to that. But what I want you to see is it's not just that David had experience with God. He did. But David had particular supernatural experience with God. <laughs> David did not beat a lion and a bear in his power. You know that. I know that. He's a great warrior. He ain't all that. And so David has the experience of God handling something through him that only God could do. And that's what gives David here the confidence that God can do this because he's seen God do similar. Now, you may not have lions and bears. If you do, I don't want to know. You know, if, if you get that kind of experience with God, I don't even want to hear about it, because I don't. And it's going to make me feel bad about myself. So if you have that kind of testimony, just keep that to yourself. But you and I know from life, from experience, we know from God's word, whatever it is, God can handle it. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. The lesson of the lion, the bear, and Goliath is that the giant does not matter. The measure of the giant, the strength of the giant, the difficulty of the giant does not matter. So you and I should never, ever doubt, ever doubt, that God can. One of the foundations of faith, living itself out in a fallen, difficult, pain-filled world, is I am absolutely certain that God can do this. Now, the second step is dicier. The second stop I want to make is, will God do this? Now, I want to I start with kind of a silly example. Let's say, you know how y'all stretched out your hands to Haley and Logan 
beautiful way of expressing prayer and solidarity and all of that. I want you all to stretch out your hand and pray that God would put $25 million right here. Now, before you do it, I want to be clear on something. If he does it, it's mine, and I will be leaving immediately. Door there. If I had you do that, which I'm not going to do, if I had you do that, it would be very difficult, I think, for you to pray with any kind of real confidence that God will do that. Do you believe he can? I believe that with all my heart. There's nothing that would stop God from having $25 million appear there other than God. I am 100% confident that he can. I have zero confidence that he will. Why? I think he wants me to finish the message. I think he knows that $25 million would be unhealthy for me. He's never promised he'll do that. He's never said he'll do that. He never said, Phil, stand on stage, demand they put their hand out and create $10 million. Now, God's done things like that. God said to Moses, stick out the staff. The Red Sea will part. It's a similar thing. What's Moses better than me? He gets a parted sea, I get nothing. But God said, Moses, do this and I'm going to do that. He didn't, unfortunately. That's what I was doing this morning that Gene interrupted. I was saying, God, <laughs> give me the vision that you are going to put $25 million there, and Gene comes in, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm trying to secure our retirement. <laughs> but David has profound confidence that God will do this too. David believes God can. He also has confidence that God will. Why? Okay, two reasons. First reason, let's look at 1 Samuel 17, verse 26. David asked the men who were standing there, what will be done for the man who strikes down this Philistine? And he goes into this question. And then he says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he defies the armies of the living God? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he defies Defies the armies of the living God. Notice what David says there. He does not say, as everyone has said all through the passage up to this time, everyone said the armies of Israel. Goliath said it. The soldiers say it. Saul says it. David says, not the armies of Israel. The armies of the living God. David sees this threat as directed not just at Israel, but at God himself. And so David has the idea that God will defend himself through David, David's action. So one is, David sees this as an insult to God. Now the second reason is in verses 8 and 9. So let's go to verses 8 and 9. Goliath stood, called Israel's armies. Why do you come out to prepare for battle? Am I not the Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose for yourselves a man so he may come meet me. Then verse 9, Goliath says, If he's able to fight with me and strike me down, we will become your servants. But if I prevail and strike him down, you will become our servants. What's at stake here is the enslavement of God's people. Now again, tread carefully. God has already, in Samuel, not helped them with every single battle. He does with some, some he doesn't. Now we have reasons why he doesn't in those cases. 
God has also shown himself willing to have his people enslaved. So they're enslaved in Egypt. Later on, the Babylonian Empire is going to sweep in and enslave them. God is willing to have his people enslaved. Here's the thing. God decides when, by whom, and how his people will be enslaved, not Goliath. The fact that Goliath challenges this does not define God's will. And so David says, well, Goliath is threatening God himself and threatening enslavement that God has not proclaimed. And so I believe that God will do this. Now, here's the thing. Again, just honest observation. Many years into my own walk with God, 30 years of being a pastor, most of the time that I have seen people exercise faith, it's in circumstances where they're not sure what God is going to do. Most of the time I've seen people exercise faith, it's where they're not sure what God is going to do. I've prayed for a lot of people to be healed. Some have. And some haven't. I remember just vividly when my mom started to struggle with macular degeneration. And reading was just one of my mom's joys and pleasures. It was one of the things that just she used constantly. And as she got older and older and more and more limited, it was one of the very few things that like could transport her out of that. And she started to get macular degeneration and started to lose that center vision. And people prayed. And she was part of a, of, a, of a group called the Order of St. Luke. She was more, mom was, I think, the most devoted follower I've ever seen. She had an intimate relationship with Jesus that I just wish I could come close. And God didn't stop it. And she lost her vision partially, and people prayed. And she lost more of her vision, and people prayed. And she lost more of her vision, and people prayed. And it got to the point where there were two things from mom. Mom couldn't read, and she couldn't see people's faces. For mom... Those were the two things that made life worthwhile. Reading in other people's faces. And God said, no. This is the path. This is the journey. Mom never wavered. She never complained. If you didn't ask her about it, she would never even tell you. It's where I get it. She was a genius at deception. And so she would make you think she knows who you are, even though she doesn't. Because she couldn't see you. People prayed. They believed. They declared. There were people who understood healing ministry, knew what it was. That's what their ministry was. And God said, no. I know God could have. I know he could have. But he didn't. And so what do we do? When we know God can, but we're not sure he will, what do we do? Well, you trust God, Phil. Shut up. I don't want to hear that. I want more than that. I need more than that. One of the most amazing demonstrations of faith biblically to me are two of, of Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you watch the Veggie Tales, Rack, Shack, and Benny. 
And they're standing at the edge of a fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar is saying, all you have to do, just pray to me. It's all you have to do. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to follow up on it. Just do it, and I won't throw you in there. And they're standing there, and what they say is this. I believe God can save me from this. But even if he doesn't, I will not worship you. Even if he doesn't. I've spent 30 years wondering, what are they trusting? What is it that they're latching on to? And I've come up with four things that I'm going to give you really quickly in one sentence. God is always this. He is always present. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Whatever the struggle is, he sees you and he sees it. God is always powerful. He can handle it. Whatever it is, he is always active. God is never a passive watcher. Even as mom lost her vision, God was not a passive watcher. I'm not saying he took her vision, but he wasn't just watching. God is active and God is good. I'm still not sure how, other than maybe this sermon illustration for you, I'm not sure how mom's loss of her vision was good. Maybe I'll never know. Maybe it's just the impact it had on me watching her live out faith as she lost one of the most important things in the world to her. Maybe that was it. I don't know. But I believe with all my heart today, God is present, powerful, active, and good. Always. Everywhere. All the time. Every circumstance. Every problem. Every struggle. Every joy. Every doubt. He is those things. Imagine what an amazing opportunity you and I have as we face this upcoming election. Because there's going to be tons of junk from everybody about everything. And what you and I can do is in the middle of this whole thing, whatever the turmoil is, maybe, it's, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's just going to be a little blip on the radar. But whatever the turmoil is, you and I have the opportunity here to say God is present, powerful, active, and good and therefore I trust him. I don't trust that he will. I trust that he is. And those are two different things. Our faith is trusting that God is something. He is someone. Not that he will do a particular thing. So you pray with me. God, there is a huge part of me that just wants to stand up here and say, you're going to do it. Just trust you because you're going to do it. You're going to save mom's vision. You're going to give me $25 million. That you're going to defeat the giants in my life in the way I want you to. And Lord, the giants in my life I know are nothing compared to the giants that some of the people sitting in this room are facing. And we look at those things and we say, God, I can't. And we're right. I can't take it. I can't handle it. I can't figure it out. But we also look at those things today and we say, I can't, but you can. And we say, God, together I trust you. 
trust you because you're present, you're powerful, you're active, and you're good. I know you can save me from the fiery furnace, but if you don't, I will follow. I believe you can defeat Goliath, but if you don't, I will follow. Lord, help us to follow you, not because of what you will do, but because of who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are going to do something special now. And so we're really excited for this. And if you've ever taken or studied um, the, the history of the church, one of the things that you find if you look at the history of the church, especially in the early church, is the importance that they placed on baptism. <clears throat> and so in order to participate in communion, or so they'd, they'd meet in homes. So if you weren't baptized when they did the dinner portion, when they did the communion portion, um, you had to leave. If you, if you weren't baptized, you weren't a part of the body. You'd be, you'd be separated out. And, and so the act of baptism... Why was it so important for them? It wasn't, it wasn't that the salvation is in baptism. We believe salvation is in our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That we are, we are sinners separated from God and through the work of Jesus on the cross, he has reunited us. He has, he has become, we have become one with the Lord. The Holy Spirit is inside of us and we have eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's, that's sal our salvation is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. But it was the fact that baptism represented the public declaration. It represented the idea of, I'm risking my life publicly to declare that I'm a follower of Jesus. Maybe it's something that we don't understand. We have um, two young ladies who are going to get baptized here today. And uh, I'm pretty sure there's nobody in the room who are going to stand up and try to kill them or persecute them because of their belief today. But this is what they're doing. They're declaring that they're a follower of Jesus. And that Jesus is going to be the anchor and the hope and the joy of their lives. That's the importance of baptism. And I just, just if you could picture that for me, just, just imagine going back 2,000 years Imagine the welcome party and the joy that the church would have around you when you became baptized and when you became a part of the body. And that's the joy that we should have as these young ladies get baptized today. And so, um, are we ready? You can come on up here. Um, and uh, we'll do this. We'll get ready here. Gene's going to kind of just uh, play over us. And um, I'm going to ask you a question here, um, what your name is and why you're doing this today. Are you ready? So what's your name and why are you doing this today? My name is Cassidy Bellander, and I'm getting baptized today because... I feel like God has convicted me to do it, and I want to proclaim that I am his daughter, and I'm not ashamed to be his daughter. Uh, my name is Megan, and I want to give my life to Christ. Amen. Amen. And so this is what we're going to do. So um, if you will just join us and just worship with us as we do this and just uh, be praying over them. Um, we'll hop in the tub here and uh, we'll do some baptism. Till from heaven you came running 
There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and promise to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. Praise the Father. Amen. Can we give one more round of applause for them? It's a celebration, a joyful day. I love that the word says that all of heaven rejoices when somebody makes a decision for Jesus. I love that. All right. Um, so we have lunch now. I'm going to pray for food in just a second. Uh, the weather outside is, is, is not really good weather for for raking raking leaves um which is upsetting um but there there is some things i, I think we have some some uh some project backpack things that we could really use help with so um like some stuff and some envelopes and stuff and uh as well as we're gonna move a bunch of chairs around for, for worship night and some other things so um after lunch if you could stay and help we would love that um uh, let me pray for the food. Lord, we thank you for the food that you have blessed us with today. Lord, we pray that it blesses our body. Lord, bless this fellowship, this time that we are together. Lord, thank you just for the ability to gather in your presence and to worship you and, and to just commune with you and the body of Christ. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful week, everybody. We'll see you at lunch and see you at Wednesday at 6 o'clock. And don't forget to vote on Tuesday if you haven't already. There you go.